Is Tether the stablecoin of the future? So one of the interesting things about Tether and USDC, USDC was rising in adoption, uh, but it's a regulated stablecoin in the United States. And so actually people internationally don't like that. That is a turnoff to them, is that there's now a coin that the United States government has a lot of oversight in. And so Tether has continued to see adoption go up. Uh, they are the 16th largest holder of US treasuries. At this point, they are in a central part of the American financial economy. So what does that mean for Circle then as it looks to IPO? Would you be a buyer in IPO stock? I think Circle is an amazing business, and especially with high interest rates, they're going to continue to do very, very well. I think, again, it's I'm an American sitting on American soil, right? I look at these things very differently than maybe somebody does internationally. But you, again, we cannot discount. If you're the 16th largest buyer of U.S. Treasuries at the same time that China, Japan, et cetera, is all buying Treasuries less, these things are going to become a very, very important part. And then also Tether, I mean, if you look at their numbers, right, it's one of the most profitable businesses on a revenue to uh, employee basis in the world. Across a Coindesk article from January 3rd, which said that Goldman Sachs is in talks with Grayscale and BlackRock to play a key role of authorized participant for their ETFs. Where does that stand now, and are there any updates? Yeah, well, we actually, we are actually authorized participant now on seven of the Bitcoin ETFs that launched, one of which was the BlackRock um, and Grayscale as well. Um, so, so you know, we are very pleased to be able to, you know, to play that role with those kind of issuers. Um, also, when you look more broadly, Fidelity and others were also active with it as well. It was important for us, you know, our clients are very keen to, to be kind of active in these products. And so being able to act as authorized participant, which for those not familiar, that just enables you to be involved with the creation and the redemption of the uh, Bitcoin fund units. Um, ETF uh, issuance certificates, rather, um, which I think is kind of an, also an interesting point to mention. So had these products been um, kind of created and redeemed in kind, which means you'd have had to have kind of, you know, been involved with the underlying asset, that would have been more difficult for us to, as an institution to be involved. But the fact that they were cash, create and redemption has meant that we have been involved. And so being able to work with, you know, like the Black Rocks and others has been very important for us. Um, so we're delighted to be. I recently read a Reuters article where you were quoted as saying there's a huge appetite for blockchain-based assets, which grew significantly in recent months. Why do you think that is? I think it, you know, it comes down to people recognize that the technology that we've talked about, you know, quite a lot over the last few years is fit for purpose. You know, I always use the example of using blockchain technology for collateral mobility. You know, often people have talked about over the last few years, you know, blockchain is kind of this technology, you know, looking for a problem to solve. But if I look at the way collateral moves across the market, actually there is very clearly a problem there, you know, in terms of the fails, the, the inefficiencies, operational settlement. Um, and so te the, the blockchain technology can actually have a very profound positive impact on the way those marketplaces operate globally. And if you think we're in a world now where capital and liquidity becomes more expensive, this ability just to be more efficient, you know, kind of in the use of the financial instruments on the blockchain technology, that's very powerful. And again, it's not something kind of new in the sense that we've been talking about this for a while, but I think what's new is the broad, the, the, the kind of much broader kind of set of institutions now looking to be more actively involved. And um, I think people can see how to commercialize and I think that's the key point so so about the adoption liquidity as I went back to one of my earlier points that's kind of key and a big focus of everyone but you can really start to see now how people can show the commercial value proposition in a way that organizations can say okay fine we are going to continue to move forward with our strategies and building out the teams it's including tokenization which you yep. just brought up once yep. again and you also mentioned that you were looking to re-architect the financial plumbing so that blockchain technology can have a profound impact on the movement of collateral across the marketplace, which you brought up again as well. Yeah. But are those still focuses of That'd yours right now? And would you like to elaborate on some of the other predictions, perhaps the expansion to new assets? Yeah, I think, look, you touched on a lot of good points there. So I think um, in terms of tokenization, you know, when I talk about the creation of marketplaces with a broader cross-section of stakeholders, there's no lack of appetite, you know, from the many different forums I'm involved in globally, you know, in terms of the cross-section of stakeholders in the market, be that sell side by side, and as I said, the, the kind of FMIs. 
And so it's kind of fine tuning what is it exactly they need. So in the context of tokenization, there's no lack of interest, but it's creating the secondary liquidity, creating those marketplaces. So that's a big focus of ours, but many others across the market. And there's a positive momentum there that we think we'll really start to see that kind of play through this year. It'll start small, but once you can start to prove that out, you then bring in the broader cross section of investors, you know, which is a lot many of the buy side who have built out their digital asset strategies and teams. We discussed Goldman Sachs digital assets platform, yep. GSDAP, yep. which launched in November 2022. So now that it has been more than a year since its launch, how's it going? Well, I mean, if you take the three awards that we won, you know, really well. Um, you know, we've, we're very excited about how, you know, it's evolved. We're live in Asia. And actually, we have the, the kind of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority debt issuance that we executed last year. That's going to mature in February of this year. So you'll have seen the full life cycle from issuance, secondary trading to maturity. And I think, again, that's a powerful kind of endorsement of what's been developed on the platform. Um, to show that you can actually kind of digitize the whole life cycle and you start to, as a byproduct of that, see the efficiencies that can be gained. And so that's hugely positive. We matured the debt instrument in Europe as well. We're going live in the US in the next month or two as well. So we will have a platform that will be you know, active across, across the key geographies. Um, so we're very happy. We're working very closely with a number of stakeholders as we start to kind of move forward on a number of other projects. And it comes back into kind of one of the points, you know, I was talking about earlier, scale's key, you know, creating that marketplace, but liquidity is at the heart of everything. Um, and that for us is, you know, a big focus, you know, both the US, Europe um, in particular. Welcome, Welcome to the crypto, crypto teacher. teacher. And you know, I come back with that video just to make you think. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. And make sure you join the Patreons. If you're not a part of Patreons, Make sure you're in the cash app. And we have Pomp on Tether, the 16th largest buyer of U.S. Treasuries. And guys, we know the emerging markets are letting U.S. Treasuries go. Why? Because the United States dollar is about to fall. And we know this Tether setup is a take down 99% of these cryptos and the small and medium-sized banks. And who gets to blame crypto? But at the same time, crypto is going to be rising. And remember the crypto teacher told you. And guys, we have Goldman Sachs, a participant out of seven of the Bitcoin spot ETFs. And we know JP Morgan is in there also. You can't make this stuff up. We know the banks are the biggest what? I'll let you finish that. And then Goldman Sachs, McDermott speaks about tokenization blockchain re-architecting the financial plumbing and we know that's the digital transformation this fourth industrial revolution and goldman sachs digital asset platform is alive and well is this behind the curtain sitting in the emerging markets hong kong at that and we know hong kong is nothing but a straw man for china and McDermott bought up liquidity. It's all about liquidity. And we know that's the reason why XRP and XLM are so important. And then we have CNBC speaking about 15-minute cities without speaking about 15-minute cities. Rewards for paying rent. We know they got to dangle that carrot because we know a lot of people are about to be out of work. But then they talk about commerce for the neighborhood. And we know this is all a setup for the 15-minute cities. Remember, guys, this is a plan. It moves in phases. And, guys, I'm going to be doing a crypto Patreon video and then also a stock Patreon video because, guys, the stock market is making absolutely no sense. It's the same stocks getting the money. And we have Netflix moving up just off subscribers when we clearly know they've been raising prices in the United States and lowering in the emerging markets. Remember, guys, this is numbers. It's, you can play with numbers all day, and you can allow things you normally wouldn't allow in order to move the agenda forward. We know these fire sticks is out where people have been getting free service. It was all about getting rid of the old TV service in order to bring in the streaming 
and now people are paying more for streaming than they were for regular TV. And if you remember, back in the day, you could get free cable with a little box, and the only thing they did was flip a button. That's the same thing they can do now. They can flip a button because you clearly know if you want to watch something really, really important, they make sure they block it. But eventually, there will only be one or two survivors most likely, it'll just be Amazon that will control all sports, gaming, Netflix may hang in there. But remember the go, guys. The fourth industrial revolution and part of the fourth industrial revolution is the metaverse. And once they get the sheep in the metaverse, you're not coming out. Because guys, we know once they download you, they're able to delete you. The brain is nothing but software. That's the reason why it's so important to educate yourself on this technology. So therefore, you don't fall for the devil's tricks. And remember the crypto teacher told you. Because he knows, when it comes to the NWO, it's all planned out. You have a wonderful day. To explain what Bill does for everybody. It's like Rent is the single biggest expense for most people in this country. Right. You don't get anything back for paying rent every month. And so we said, why can't you earn points on rent just like you do on everything else, right? earn airline miles, earn hotel points. And by the way, why doesn't paying rent build your credit and get you closer to home ownership? Yeah. And so today, you can pay with Built at any apartment in the United States, earn points and miles, build your credit. And the coolest part is we've now expanded that beyond just rent and said, you not only get rewarded on rent, but in your neighborhood, all these local restaurants, local grocery stores, coffee right. shops can now tap into okay. the loyalty platform. Explain the business model, though, because I think people are probably hearing you say, OK, all of a sudden you get rewards back. Yes. Who is paying for these? Who is paying for these <laughs> rewards? Right. So the amazing thing about this is you first look at rent. I mean, we're at almost 20 billion dollars a year spent. Right. Now you think about it, we are a payment processor for the rental buildings, just like Stripe is for all these e-commerce. So we make money on payment processing there. Right. But then as we go into the expanded merchant side of the local merchants, I mean, this is what Ken invented, right? If you can bring high value local residents to build loyalty in their neighborhood, I mean, rather than local restaurants running into an apartment building, putting up flyers, offering a 10% like discount. It's like amateur rewards. So that's right. what exactly. you bring. Right. You yes, that it has some similarities to membership rewards. But I think one of the important points here that I think can be transformational is if you think about commerce in the neighborhood, there's been no platform that, in fact, has put that all together to drive local commerce. Small biz, too? Small business, absolutely. Right. Small business benefits tremendously. It's one of the reasons why I'm excited is this is the first neighborhood loyalty platform. But, but, explain, but uh, let's go back to the math of it, because yeah. I, I do want to understand 100%. The, the economics of it. So you're collecting a fee, uh, you're a, a processing fee, a Correct. transaction fee every time. Correct. Which, which is what percent? Which is what percent? I mean, it depends on the type of payment method. You can pay by bank ACH. You can pay okay, by but are we talking between one and a half and three percent? Are we talking Amex style? I mean, Amex was three percent. Mastercard it, was lower. Obviously. It really depends if you pay by yeah. Amex or pay by Visa or pay by Mastercard. If you pay with your bank, what's the lowest you can get? That's right. So you yeah. and so you get different levels what, of points. What's the rate for the lowest if, if you pay by it bank? It depends on the landlord too and the property owner. Is going right. to be the new metric that people are look, judging it on. They rolled it out in a bunch of markets. They'll roll it out further, mm -hmm. and everyone will now pay into the competitive beast that Netflix was, and they will continue to eat everyone else's. And sports and, and everything. And everything. And international. And, and we're paying more with all of our budget than we did for cable TV. Yes. Yep. How do you like that? I, I don't like it. I, I fell victim. Bull market has broken so many rules that it astonishes me every day. Going to a different economy, and we're going to be learning more about that uh, as we go, but clearly we're, we're, we're learning that things can be done uh, from remote, remote locations. We're learning that technology can replace people even more than we thought. We're not going back to the same economy. We're going, we're recovering, but to a different economy. And it'll be one that is more leveraged to technology. And I worry that that is going to make it even more difficult than it was for, for many workers. In Silicon Valley and my friends who work in technology know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we are now going to do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and then even bookkeepers, accountants, uh, insurance agents, lawyers, and on and on through the economy. So what happened to the manufacturing workers is a very clear sign. And so we'll import Chinese 
based CBDC technology. So it's going to be CBDC in a box uh, provided to you by the People's Bank of China. But every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every private business, every piece of real estate will eventually be a token on a blockchain, an entry on a ledger, permanent and immutable. We will have truth instead of trust, and we will save over $7 trillion a year. Six to 8% of global GDP is wasted by the friction of the trust industry that's necessary when you have dual entry accounting. With triple entry accounting, which is what a blockchain is, mm -hmm. we get rid of all of that friction. It's a beautiful future. Like what you see in China and their social credit scoring systems, right? If we get identity wrong, you know, it could be a tool to enslave humanity. And if we get it right, it could be a tool to liberate humanity as an American. You know, uh, uh, I'm obviously rooting for the, the one that's on the side of freedom. Bitcoin is an international asset. And also, I do believe the role of crypto is, um, it is, it, it, it's digitizing gold. I actually believe this technology is going to be very important. I am, I, you know, look at it. We have been part of a huge revolution in investing through ETFs. We believe that ETFs will be changing the whole way we invest. Many people still use it as a means, well, people are investing it for indexing. No, the majority of people who are putting money in an index, in an ETF are active investors that are buying exposure. The entire bond market is being transformed as we talk right now. I believe the next generation for markets, the next generation for securities will be, will be tokenization of securities. Um, we will, and if we can have that distributed ledger that we know every beneficial owner, every beneficial uh, seller, we all have our, our, our code right. of who's buying, who's selling, instantaneous settlement. And think about it, it changes the whole ecosystem. The Chinese bank ICBC has been hit by a ransomware attack, and the U.S. Treasury market, as a result of that, um, has been disrupted. This, according to the Financial Times, we're going to get more right now with Bloomberg's Shanali Bassick. Shanali, what do we know? Uh, listen, we have the Financial Times now reporting that ICBC, one of China's largest banks here, was hit with a ransomware attack. And remember, they're a, a, a very significant intermediary in the Treasury market. The SIFMA has told his members that this has been part of the reason here uh, that the system has kind of clogged up, if you will, during that auction that we saw a little bit before. The attack had prevented ICBC, according to the Financial Times, from settling treasury trades on behalf of other market participants. A large executive at a major bank also telling the paper that such a large party on the fixed income clearing corp uh, creates major concerns, potentially impacting the liquidity of treasury markets. Now it was not just the poor auction. It was absolutely lousy, and, and uh, uh, you know, when, when the dealers have to step in to save a treasury auction, uh, that's a rare occurrence. And Crypto teacher and the new world order book, plus the three kids' books, it's time to re-educate. Also, new to cryptos, Coinbase, Bitchu, Binance. Do not forget book links and crypto links are in the description. The stock channel, guys. Don't forget to go like, subscribe, spread everywhere. You have your Kobo, your chip size, your banking, your gaming, while everybody's sitting at home, get on stocks, the receiver of the biotech stocks, and while everybody's at home wishing, they were still getting that free money. What are they doing? Drinking and smoking weed. Don't forget about those stocks, and you have a wonderful day. The most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation to come. Steve Jobs. And guys, you know I truly believe in this. When you look at the New World Order, they're the storytellers. And that's the reason why I wrote my New World Order book. But guys, now it's time to change the current generation. And I wrote three kids' books. You know, I love the Trinity because I understand the power that's in it. So I have three books. We have an opportunity to change the generation, to educate, not just me, but I want to show you that I take action on a daily basis. And I want you to take action on a daily basis, whether it's your job, whether it's in your community. We have an opportunity right now to educate the masses. I posted this on my Twitter account. Please share. But this is a short clip of the three books. There's going to be a clothing line and action figure. 
Please get these books for your kids, nephews, cousins, friends, so therefore we can start the re-education now. Because as we see, the fourth industrial revolution foundation is definitely here. Robots, algorithms, drones, taking humanity out the picture. We have to re-educate. But let's get into the video. Part 1. King Yahshua and Drama Tim. Save the village. Part 2. King Yahshua and Drama Tim. Save New York. Long COVID-33. Part 3. King Yahshua and Drama Tim. Goes to China. It's mandatory to get part one, part two, and part three of this series. It's time to re-educate Generation Z.